Good morning, everybody. I'm Mike Quinones, and uh, welcome to our second morning session on the aortic uh, and prosthetic valves, the aortic valve and the prosthetic valves. Uh, our first speaker uh, doesn't need any introduction. Is the infamous uh, Neil Kleinman. He's so old and famous that he doesn't need to be introduced. <laughs> We've only worked together for about 30 years. So. <laughs> and Neil is going to talk to us on, on the state of the art of, of Tabard in 2018. Okay, well, thanks, guys. I understand there are a few seats left up front, uh, <laughs> so you may want to move up. And uh, so uh, I would like to thank Dr. Barker for inviting me to speak here. Colin, uh, could you hold on? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm supposed to tell you where we are now. So here's the short answer. If there was any question. Okay, there's also a long answer, and that's to follow. So, listen, uh, ser well, nothing's serious, but um, you're going to hear a lot of data from the ACC STS uh, registry. And a um, couple of things you've got to realize it was established five years ago by a joint agreement between the professional societies and the payers, mainly CMS. And what that means is you don't have to participate unless, of course, you want to get paid for doing procedures, in which case you do have to participate. So that means that every consecutive patient is entered. So it's a great source of data, but you have to recognize it's got limitations. And what's the limitation? It's a registry. And what's the number one rule of registries? Anyone? It's self-reported. There's always an accuracy issue. It's great to learn about what people are doing. There's no other source to tell you what happens in the real world. But there are things that it can't really tell you. There are things it will try to tell you. And proponents of registries will take some pieces of data and try to run them into the end zone. But you know, when they get there, you've got to recognize there's no football in their hands. Uh, you cannot make valid comparisons from a registry. And uh, the rule that uh, one of my friends and mentors, Harvey White, taught me is if you look at registry data and they are comparing outcomes among two different kinds of treatments, turn the page. So recognize that. That's the limitation. That's the benefit. Consecutive patients tells you what people are doing. Uh, the limitation is that uh, it is not an accurate source to compare outcomes between treatments. OK, so what do we know? Well, we know TAVR volume is increasing. That's not a surprise. Look at these curves. It's been taking off exponentially. This is from 2017. I don't know what the uh, data as of today are. Those haven't been released. Uh, these were released this spring. Look, look at the growth, 50,000 a year easily. And I don't remember how many centers are participating here, but it's close to 500. At the same time, we know from a variety of registries, this being from France, that comorbidities are decreasing. We're not reserving TAVR for the old and infirm. Six years, 35% decrease in comorbidity indices. And that means we are working more on healthier patients and less on patients who truly are moribund. And take a look. Mortality decreasing a lot, progressively and consistently. And this little star is the reported rate for surgical AVR 2015. That's the most recent report that's in the literature. So we're getting down there in a population that's been much sicker. The procedures are becoming much less complicated. Cardiopulmonary bypass, well under 1%. Conversion to open procedures, 0.5%. Length of stay also coming down as we're getting more sophisticated about doing these procedures, doing them efficiently, doing them perhaps less invasively. And again, yellow star tells you what the most recent data for open surgery are. These are our own experience. I showed this last year. Mike Reardon's shown this a number of times, too. As TAVR started, 
and we generated referrals, pulled up the surgical volume. But take a look, as Tavar has replaced open surgery in some cases, this uh, open surgical volume has decreased. So what are the victories? We're not going to go through all the details here. But inoperable or extreme risk patients, partner cohort B, beats medical therapy, although survival at five years, even with Tavar, is still only 30%. So it's really hard to call that treatment truly a success or a cure. Extreme risk, core valve, beat the performance goal. Move down the risk stratum, operable but high risk for Savar. Partner cohort A, equivalent, core valve, high risk, equivalent in the early years, I'll show you. We now have five years data that show it's identical. Intermediate risk, Dr. Reardon has presented these data for the first time last year, um, equivalent to a performance goal in the partner trial in Sertavi, which is what Dr. Reardon presented, equivalent to surgical AVR. We already know this. Th these data are a year old, a uh, year to a year and a half. These are the five-year survival after TAVAR in inoperable patients. I've shown you the partner data because this is the only true randomized comparison. Clearly a difference, but again, 70% mortality in this population of very sick patients at five years. You can't really say this is great treatment. I mean, maybe there is no great treatment for this population. But, you know, again, this is a large number of survivors who otherwise would not have made it. We now have five-year data from core valve. Again, uh, looks a little better early on at five years, looks identical. And these are some data from core valve. If you follow the valves out for five years, and this is going to be an important point, I'm convinced. The performance of the valves remains slightly better than the performance of surgical valves. The gradients are a little bit lower. The uh, valve areas a little bit higher. And we, at five years, we don't see a signal for valve deterioration. This shows you aortic regurgitation. And this is with a first generation core valve, uh, low re regurg rates. They don't get worse. The valves don't fall apart. If you look for structural uh, valve deterioration, it's uncommon. So the initial concerns about durability, durability at least to five years, look great. Intermediate risk patients, as we move farther down the spectrum, uh, this is the uh, Sertavi randomized trial. So is this. Better slide, huh? Uh, out to two years, virtually identical, and fewer of the acute complications uh, that you'd expect to see. Blood loss, atrial fib, acute uh, kidney injury. Okay, so that, that stuff's not really new, but in 2018, TAVR is no longer reserved for the infirm or inoperable. That's the wrong way to think about the procedure now. Um, so a couple of things that uh, really are relatively new. Conscious sedation. This has been, for a few years, the chic thing. When we have panels, everyone on the panel brags about what their percentage of conscious sedation is. Oh, we've moved out of the dark ages. You know, and you may think there are some advantages to conscious sedation. It certainly looks easier. It's easier to tell a patient we don't have to put you to sleep to do the procedure. But, oh, we're out of order. Okay, we'll come back to conscious sedation. I apologize. My, my slides are out of order. So, again, we're not looking at uh, TAVR for the uh, infirm and inoperable only. And I, I want to share this with you. This is an ad for the trifecta valve that popped up uh, uh, you know, as an ad when I was looking at one of the journals. And take a look at this area of circle. Only one Saver valve delivers TAVR-like single-digit gradients across more, uh, more valve sites. Think about that. Surgical valves are now being held up to TAVR with TAVR as the gold standard. 
This is a canary in the coal mine. This is telling you what's happening. As we move forward, as we move into lower risk patients and see that the treatment is both safe and effective in those patients, I think in many cases, TAVR is going to become the standard. I think this is uh, the most solid indicator of that that I've seen thus far. And if you look into Sertavi, um, there are a few hints of, of things to come. There are two randomized trials among patients at low risk for surgical AVR in whom the considerations are very different, valve durability, long horizons, things have to work, they have to be uncomplicated, they have to last a long time when you go into healthier patients who are going to be alive 10 years from now. Well, take a look. We don't have those data yet. We will next year, at least for the early follow-ups. But these are, I guess these didn't come out too well, these are data from Sertavi that we published in Euro Intervention. And take a look. Patients are stratified here according to uh, STS risk, so the risk for open surgery. Take a look at the blue lines for TAVR. Look at those event rates in one year, 1.3%. That's pretty good. That's not a group of low-risk patients, but they are the patients within Sertavi, granted judged by the heart teams to be at intermediate risk, but who were in the lowest tertile of, low, of intermediate risk. And take a look. 1.3%. I hope that that indicates something we're going to see down the line. Take a look at surgery, open valve replacement. That uh, event rate is 6.5% for the blue line. Maybe this is the way things will look for us next year. But as uh, Yogi Berra said, it's always difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Okay, I showed you a little bit of conscious sedation data. I was going to say, when we have panels, we always have uh, a Dr. Quinones. What's a nice way to say pissing contests? <laughs> pissing contests. Okay. We always have pissing contests about who's got the lowest rate of general anesthesia. Uh, you know, here's the first randomized comparison presented two weeks ago at TCT. 447 patients, so not a huge study, randomized to general endotracheal anesthesia or monitored anesthesia control. No difference. Now, this is a little unusual. Uh, not everyone with general anesthesia had a transesophageal echo. Only about a third of patients did. But uh, it's still pretty impressive. Uh, all these benefits that we always talk about for uh, conscious sedation during TAVR, didn't show up. The real truth is if you have good anesthesia, it probably doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, to me, that's a very important finding coming out. Here's something else. Stroke. We're all worried about stroke. It's a serious complication of TAVR. In fact, when TAVR started, we thought mistakenly that the stroke rates were going to be higher because of particle embolization. Well, in fact, how often stroke occurs depends almost entirely on how diligent you are about looking for it. Self-reporting gives you a 2% rate. Uh, in clinical trials, it's 7 or 8% at one year because even small defects are recorded. Patients are almost required to have MRIs. You find things when you look at them. We know that 80% of patients have multiple emboli to the brain after TAVR, 50% after SAVR. You probably heard about that yesterday, but it's still an issue. These are data, uh, this curve uh, on your left show data on the instantaneous risk taken from the core valve trials. Most of the risk occurs up early, but after about a week, there's a steady state, a steady rate of stroke occurrence. We're still looking, though, at about 4% in the first week, three-fourths of which are uh, categorized as, di as disabling stroke. Well, what are those from? Mostly, we believe they're from particulate embolization. So uh, devices have been developed to catch emboli, filters or deflection devices, if you will. 
So the first uh, device to be tested and approved in the U.S., the Sentinel device, which is inserted by a transradial approach, um, blocks float or other places a filter in uh, the three of the four great vessels. Cleared uh, by the FDA a year ago, approved a month ago by CMS. So this is great. We now have something that's going to catch emboli. Here are the data for randomized trials of embolic protection. What you can see is that if you look at total stroke, it's not really reduced, or it is very marginally so. What we have shown so far is if you look at total embolic volume by MRI, uh, meaning the amount of tissue in the brain that's involved, there are significant and consistent differences. But there's a problem. Uh, the problem's money, and the, that means deciding who to use it in. So, so far, we have no consistent predictors of the risk for stroke. Imaging, bad aortas, bad valves, not there. Atrial fib, in some databases, yes, and some, no. Maybe the anticoagulation that you give for atrial fib protects you from valve-related thrombi. We don't know that. But think about it. If you can't predict who's going to benefit, you either use it in everyone or you use it in no one. And I think given the uh, morbidity that's associated with stroke, we probably will end up using this in everyone. So uh, sorry for going 30 seconds over, but thank you very much. Thank you, Neil.